it's a great pleasure for me to introduce Paul McVeigh here tonight to you. Uh, we've just met for the first time. We've had a bit of an exchange beforehand, but you know, met also 45 minutes ago. And, uh, but I know a few things about uh, Paul. Uh, like the hero of the book we're going to discuss tonight, he was born in a Catholic neighborhood in Belfast. And uh, he began his literary career writing comedy shows. Some of them were uh, shown in Edinburgh, uh, some of them were shown in London in the West End. But then he got infatuated with short stories and you know, changed from comedy writing to short story writing. And a lot of his short stories have been published in various anthologies and they've been read on BBC Three and Four and Five and you know, there are so many radio stations from the BBC. And, um, and also he co-founded uh, the London um, Short Story Festival and I think right now he's an associate director at Word Factory and that's for our German guests. I have to look this up too. That's like a center for the short story in, in the UK, right? Sort of it's like a center of excellence for short stories. And uh, he's not also very well known for his literary works, but I think that's what I figured that you can see also from all these fabulous he reviews he gets from colleagues. He seems to be well known in the literary scene because he runs a blog. He runs a blog that's all about, uh, um, what do you say, uh, runs a blog that's sort of uh, about, you know, literary prices, competitions, and where writers have possibilities to hand in uh, submissions and so on. And this blog gets 40,000 hits a month, and I was extremely jealous when I read that. <laughs> so, um, Paul has lived most of his time in England, but it re has recently moved back to Belfast, and we might want to talk about that later as well, because, you know, like, uh, if we hear about the book, we will see that uh, the childhood life uh, in the Catholic neighborhood was, um, well, it was sort of not a relaxed, luxurious life of leisures, but uh, sort of a very special life. But, you know, he's moved back into the same neighborhood that he grew up in, if I got that right. So th that's about Paul. And uh, now from Paul to his book. And it's a fabulous book. Oh, thank you. It's a fabulous it's book. A good start, yeah, it's a good start, I know. Um, it took, uh, I mean, I'm not sure whether he wants to hear that, but it took Paul quite a while to write this first novel, I would say. You know, he's a youngish man, but not that young. And, <laughs> and, and young yeah, a young looking man, yeah. Uh, but it's his first novel. It came out uh, 2015, so about three years ago. And it got, uh, it was, uh, so The God Son came out uh, uh, 2015. It got a lot of fabulous reviews. It won all sorts of prizes and was also nominated for other prizes. Uh, so for the Authors Club, uh, Authors Club Best First Novel Award, The Guardian's Not the Booker Prize, and also a finalist for the People's Book Prize. And also in that I thought was very interesting, The Good Son was chosen, it was an, uh, I thought an original choice, was chosen as Brighton City Reads 2016. City reads means a whole city reads and discusses the same book in a series of events. And I, I totally love the idea, and I know that in Germany um, uh, last year the first universities have then done the same thing, so that a whole university is devoted a semester to reading the same book in le lectures, workshops, seminars. And I think that's what you did in Brighton, right? As so often uh, we copied a good UK idea in Germany. And um, The Good Son has also uh, been published, uh, translated now in other languages. It came out with Wagenbach here in Germany under the title uh, Guter Junge. It's going to be published in Russian. It has been translated in France, so it was translated into French. And the latest one was Hungary, right? It's also been translated into Hungarian. And I read this book two weeks ago and uh, on two very long train journeys to the Alps. And, yeah, exactly. And I have to say, I loved it from the very first sentence. And I'm glad that you're going to also hear the very first sentence here later on. And it's a novel about so many things. And I just wanted to sort of to give you sort of so glimpses of what this is all about. Because this book is about so many different things. It's first of all a book about one long summer. Not any summer, but a very special summer. And it's not quite clear. It's either the late 70s or the early 80s. I mean, maybe we should say it's 1980, but it could be 1979, could be 1981. It's not 100% clear. But it's after the coming out of Greece, the film Greece, because the, 
that plays sometimes a role in this uh, uh, play. So, uh, so it's a countdown. It's a, it's a summer countdown. It's the weeks before, between primary school and secondary school. So when a young boy, so a 10-year-old, is waiting for a new, well, a new part of, uh, of his life. That's the one thing. It's a, a book about one long summer countdown, nine weeks, eight weeks, seven weeks, six weeks to go to the new school. And whether he likes it or not, you know, there is a new school. Um, it's also a coming of age story. In Germany, we have the term, and as we all know, and I think we have extre an extremely educated audience usually here at the British Council Seminars, it's a Bildungsroman. But it's not the long, endless version of the German Bildungsroman, but it's a very specific Bildungsroman. It's just the end of childhood and the beginning of adolescence, just, you know, just about you know, the, the hero of this book, Mickey Donnelly, is, uh, is, is about to hit puberty, but he is not that old. Then, what else? It's a moving portrait of a Catholic uh, working class family and of working class culture. It's a family tragedy. Uh, it's, it's a family tragedy that's nevertheless full of optimism and humor. It's, I, I thought it's uh, also, well, it's also a family tra uh, tra yeah, tragedy, but it's also an ode to motherly love and devotion, even if this motherly love is sometimes quite harsh, I would say. Um, it's also a close insight into the troubles, because it plays right in the center of Belfast, next to, uh, right where the different neighborhoods, you know, uh, join each other, so it's an insight into the troubles, into the tribal politics of Northern Ireland, but all from the perspective of a child. So, and it also is, and that I found reading uh, particularly difficult, and um, we should see what it will feel like when it's being read, the book. It's an introduction into Northern Irish slang and the Belfast accent, which, uh, while maybe for the Brits in the audience is easy, but for a German, hello. Um, um, it's sort of, uh, it's, it's, it's a very good accent. I had a lot of fun, because I watched them on video, and I thought, oh, I'm so glad that I read the book first. Um, <laughs> but first and foremost, First and foremost, and that's what I loved about this book, this is a book about a voice, a very special voice. Uh, Rachel already said, I used to teach at UCL in London, and I had this one colleague who I admired, Professor Swales, and whenever we discussed the uh, essays of our students, and uh, he would always say, you know, this student might not have all the right points, but I can hear a personal voice, there's something which is very authentic, which has got character. And that's, you know, that's always the essays that got the highest marks. And, and that's exactly how I felt about the nar narrator of this book. Mickey uh, uh, Donnelly, um, this hero, he, when you read this, you know, within two minutes, you are totally and utterly in love with a 10-year-old boy uh, from Belfast. And uh, that's, that's uh, what happened to me, too. I was totally in, smitten by... Um, Mickey, and uh, Paul has created this very special voice and a very remarkable character, I would say. Um, so these are just, you know, just a few things that we might want to talk about later. Uh, before uh, Paul is going to start to read, I just want to say, you know, how we have planned the evening and we can change everything. If you're revolutionary and you want something totally different, we are very flexible. But, you know, the way we've planned it is that uh, Paul is going to read first, you know, uh, you know, basically the first chapter, right? Sort of, yeah. you know, first uh, uh, starts read, you know, we have a reading, then we have sort of first, you know, to warm up a few questions, then we have a second piece of the book, then we might want to go more into the details of the seminar as well, so sexuality, gender, masculinity, all of these aspects play an important role here, because Mickey is like, is a boy like no other, at least like no other in Belfast. And um, yeah, and then we have at the end We'll have time for questions from you, from the audience. And I think this is all I want to say as an introduction. And then I would say, okay. it's yours now. I'm off. Yeah, you're off. Hello. How, how are you? All right. Thank you for coming back, because you've almost been knackered, because I was completely knackered. And so thank you for um, coming in um, tonight, uh, despite that, and Nick for staying. Thank you. And um, what did I want to say? I want to say thank you to the British Council for uh, inviting me over. I'm delighted to be back in Berlin. And um, 
What else? I'm not, I'm not going to say anything else, I don't think, except, oh, I'll have one apology. I'm sorry for being Northern Irish because um, that we speak really quickly. And so what I'm going to try really hard to do is to slow down because obviously, um, I haven't spoken to Herbert as well, um, the, the fact that, you know, you have this dialect going through here. Um, so that makes things uh, a little bit more difficult. Uh, and also that I speak quite quickly. So I go to try my best. So this is from the start of the book. Um, uh, I hope you enjoy it. I was born the day the troubles started. Wasn't I mass as me? It was you that started them, son, says she, and we all laugh, except our Paddy. I put that down to his pimples and his general ugliness. It must be hard to be happy when you've a face like that. I almost feel sorry for him. I spy a dirty big love bite on his neck and I store this ammunition to defend myself against future attacks. Steamy, flowery smelling disinfectant fills my nose and joins the sweet tasting frosties in my mouth. As Ma passes by with a tin bucket and yard brush. Now, my Ma only cleans the yard when something's up and that would be my da, as usual. Do you want the hand, Mummy, says me. No, son, says she, disappearing out the back. She didn't even look at me. I'm worried about her after last night. Do you want the hand? Our Paddy says in a girl's voice. You wee lick, says he. I'm telling my mummy and you, I say. I'm telling my mummy and you. Our Paddy mimics me. I look at wee Maggie and I give her the we just hate him, don't we, look. She gives me the yes we do, he's a big fat pig, look back. I was taught how to give looks by a monk on Cave Hill. I trained like a Jedi Knight, but my lightsaber, it was my actual face. I became Luke Skywalker. <laughs> my mission, to defend all weaklings and youngest ones and families against the evil that is older brothers. We Maggie is now my disciple, and to test her telepathy training, I send her don't worry about him because he's going to be knocked down by a lorry and then it will run over his head making his eyes pop out. Wee Maggie smiles. She got it. I think we're actually twins born years apart in some CIA supergenetic test tube type experiment. Paddy gets up leaving his dirty bowl on the table like he's King Farouk. Don't leave that for Mama Mummy, I say. Mummy's boy, says he. Shut up, you, I say. At least I don't have a dirty big love bite. We Maggie laugh chokes, and the frosty shoot from her mouth onto Paddy's jumper. Just like that wee girl in The Exorcist. I saw it at Pope John the Paul II Youth Club last week. That's your fault, you wee gay boy. Paddy slaps me on the head. Now, I try to kick him, but my shin hits the table like. Paddy laughs, wiping his jumper. And you're supposed to be the smart one. Grammar school, away on, says he. I'm smarter than you, Dumbo, I say. And by the way, does your girlfriend like sucking the pimples on your neck? <laughs> Our Paddy dives at me and he trails me off the chair by the jumper. Mommy, I shout out the back. What? My ma screams and our house trembles like when the bombs go off. Paddy, let's go, because not even Muhammad Ali would mess with my ma. Nothing, I shout out the back. Paddy grabs his blazer from the back of the chair and heads off. I raise my eye, eyebrows and smile at wee Maggie like victory is mine. There's mess on my ma's good table, so I run to the sink, get a cloth, rush back before ma comes in and kills somebody. Somebody equals me. Because even though I'm the good son in the family, I get to blame if wee Maggie does anything wrong because she's the youngest and I look after her. Wee Maggie could set me on fire and my ma would kick my head in for letting our Maggie near matches. <laughs> so I'm wiping the table and I see my reflection in the smoked glass. I look like a black baby we do collections for at school. I usually give them creamed rice. We get them free from the community centre because we're poor and because somewhere there's a place called Food Mountain and it's made from tins of creamed rice and corned beef. I think it's in Switzerland. <laughs> One day I shall be president of all Ireland. I'll be so kind and good. 
And um, I will bring all those black babies to Belfast where there's free food for poor people and they can live in the new houses that they're building at the bottom of our street. I've only seen black people on the TV. Apart from the ones starving in Africa, there's ones America stole to make slaves, which isn't very nice. But at least they gave them some clothes. You wouldn't be allowed to walk around America with no clothes on. Or Belfast. Maybe if you lived with the Protestants. I've only seen Protestants on the TV too. <laughs> Mickey, stop spacing out, wee, mom, wee Maggie tugs me. You're going to be late for school. So I throw the cleaning cloth in the sink and I run through the living room, up the stairs and tiptoe into my room because I don't want to wake my da. Ma took him back in last night when he hammered the door. In the middle of the night, sorry. He brought men with him. I listened from the top of the stairs. I told Paddy I heard Da crying and they were talking about money. The men said they were coming back today. Paddy thought Da wasn't coming back this time, but Da always comes back. I don't know why our Paddy even bothers trying to think. God bless him. I grab my school bag and I run down the stairs into the kitchen. Ma, I'm away on, I shout to the yard. Did you get washed? Ma shouts back. Aye. I look at wee Maggie through the doorway, pretend to pick my nose and wipe it on my jumper. She laughs into her hand because she thinks I'm like one of them from the TV. You know, like Laurel and Hardy and Abbott and Costello. We play them sometimes. She says, it's not fair that we don't play any girl funny ones. But I say, it's not my fault that girls aren't funny. Because if they were, shouldn't they be on the TV? I get on my horse and I ride him, dodging the chair and the table, swerve around the half open door into the living room, sideward round my dad's chair and past the sofa. Champion, no wonder, horse, I sing, saluting the TV. And then I gallop out the front door. Wee Maggie's running after me. Don't be doing that in the street, Mickey, wee Maggie says, like she's the one that looks after me. I'm not stupid, I say, go you on. And I push her back into the living room. The waste ground in front of the house becomes an open prairie, and the old knockdown houses on the right are now an abandoned gold rush mining town in the wild west, and I ride champion off into the sunset. Mr. Donnelly, what time do you call this? says Mr. McManus. I'm in the doorway looking at my feet. Sorry, sir. He's a funny frigger, Mr. McManus. He's just saying that, but I know he doesn't care due to my telepathic abilities. And a power like mine comes in very handy so you know when someone's really being real. He's pretending to be annoyed, so I'm pretending to be sorry. Go and sit down, Donnelly, Mr. McManus says, going back to his reading. And there's the hard men. The hard men, starring Twee Twin Macaulay, Big Twin Macaulay, and co-starring Monkey Magdalene. It's a film about stupid people, how they do bad at school and beat the shite out of everybody that's got a brain cell, coming to a cinema near you. Wee twin Macaulay is staring at me while chewing a straw from our bottles of milk, and he must have nicked it, because we haven't even had our milk yet. And that's the kind of bad thing he does. He's shooting pure hatred at me from his good eye. The other is pointing towards our display of Carrick Fergus Castle, the bendy eye followed a bullet that grazed his face and it decided not to come back. Well, so would I if I was his eye, having to look at that face in the mirror. <laughs> Status report, Sean Close, a.k.a. Helmet Head, under observation. Moved into my street last week, posh, therefore probably a Protestant double agent, as who's ever heard of a posh Catholic? <laughs> he has no mates, he thinks he's great. Conclusion, I hid his guts. Uh, sir, I need to go to the toilet. I stand up. You shouldn't interrupt someone, Mr. Donnelly. It's very rude. But I'm desperate. And I squeeze my dick just to prove it. Like pee is about to explode out of it. Like when you should have gone ages ago and now it's killing you like that. Oh, I'm in agony. Oh, God, I'm going to die. Hold on, I'm only acting. I actually believed myself there. I'm not good. I should actually be an actor. Sir weaves me out like a board king, and in the corridor, the class doors are open and the teachers look out as I run past. At Mrs. O'Halloran's, I slow down and look in, because we have a secret, me and Mrs. O'Halloran. Uh, oh, I've just lost myself there. Um, oh, right, we have a secret, Mrs. O'Halloran. She looks up at me and smiles. Sorry about that. 
Um, won't you come in here? Oh, if it isn't Michael Donnelly. She coos at me like a dove. Is you throwing a glass at me just because I made a mistake? I mean, come on, I'm sorry, okay? Um, <laughs> well, if it isn't Mr. Michael Donnelly, come in a wee moment. She coos at me like a dove. I am in love with Mrs. O'Halloran. I was the only one she got to take her notes to Mr. McDermott. She used to call me her wee current bun. Her wee pet, she'd say. And she said I was different, not like the other boys. I bought her a necklace on my last day in her class. It cost one whole 50p. And it had a little golden heart on it. And in the back it said, I love you. <laughs> now, class, I want you all to have a look at Mr. Michael Donnelly, she says. Her arm on my shoulder making my skin fizz. He is one of, in fact, he is the finest pupil ever to come out of Holy Cross Boys. I'm completely scundered. I take a massive redner and my face is burning like a slapped arse. St Malachy's Grammar School, it doesn't surprise me at all. You see, class, this is what you can achieve at this school with hard work and determination. She beams at me. And she's right. I am determined. I've got a plan. Get away from this school. Get smart. Get to America, get rich, bring wee Maggie and my mummy over to live with me in my penthouse. Thank you, Mrs. O'Halloran, says me, in my good boy voice, to prove to her class she's right about me. You'll be sorely missed around here, she says, smiling. She whispers, make sure you come and see me now before you finish today, won't you now, Michael? Yes, Mrs. O'Halloran, I say. And I'm completely on fire now, like a human petrol bomb. And I kick the leg of her desk and I smile and I speed walk out of there. I mean, I do want to grow up and make all my dreams come true, but mostly I just want to be back in P3 with Mrs. O'Halloran. I'm back at the class and Mr. McManus is there and Mr. Brown, the head teacher. Donnelly, come here, says Mr. Brown. And I do, because he's one scary specimen. I've never been in trouble in school, because I'm a good boy. Uh, it can't be about anything I've done. It must be about me going to St. Malachy's. Mr. Brown said it was best not to tell the other boys. And he finished the sentence with this look that said, if you want to get out of here alive. Mr. Brown is whispering to Mr. McManus, looking very serious. Mr. Brown puts his hand on my back and pushes me along the corridor. I'm standing at the window, looking out of the tarmac playground covered in glass and splats of colour from the paint bombs the hard, man, the hard men threw over the walls at night. Reflected in the window, I see Mr McManus. His hand is over his mouth and he's staring at his feet. Mr Brown has one hand in his pocket and the other is rubbing his baldy head. Something's wrong. It's like one of those scenes in a film where someone's being told bad news and there's music playing and we know what they're saying even though we can't hear the words. Usually the hero is being told he's terminally ill or his parents have died in a car crash. We don't have a car, so follow me, says Mr Brown, and I do. But I look round at Mr McManus who's still in the doorway smiling at me like, like I've got leukaemia. I did have a nosebleed last Christmas. I do feel a bit dizzy now, he mentions it. At the end of the corridor, Mr. Brown, his office door is open and he walks in and I wait outside. I'm in my hospital bed. The whole family are kneeling by me, crying. And I raise myself to say, I forgive you all, even you, Paddy. And I smile at him, touching his head, and then I die. Come in, Michael, says Mr. Brown, which is the first time in seven years he's called me by my first name. Holy shite, my ma and da are here in their Sunday clothes. This is getting to TV. <laughs> Sit down, son, says da, all nice. Hopefully Mr. Brown can't smell last night's drink under da's polo minty breath. I sit in the empty chair. Michael, I know we've spoken about the offer from St. Malachy's Grammar School, and I want to assure you that we're all extremely proud of you here at Holy Cross, says Mr. Brown, fidgeting with his paper. You're a big boy now, Michael, and there are certain things you have to understand. He folds his fingers like a cat's cradle and taps the knotted bunch on the desk. He takes a deep breath. Michael, your mum and dad have asked me to talk to you to help you understand that. Ma coughs and she shifts in her chair and looks at the floor. Unfortunately, Michael, you're not able to go to St Malachy's. 
Mr. Brown's mouth moves, but there's no sound. Concentrate, Mickey. Don't space out. I hear something about five years and trips and uniforms and books and how I'd have to get two buses there and two buses back. But I love buses, I say. And I'm looking at my ma to back me up because she knows I do. But she's staring at Mr. Brown, who gets up from his seat and plays with the blinds all the while talking. And my breathing is loud in my ears and I keep missing what he's saying. Like when our Paddy turns the the sound down on the TV and up again, just to annoy me. Your mummy and daddy can't afford it, Michael. They feel terrible, Mr. Brown says. Now, Ma's face is purple. She's not going to say anything. And whatever's jamming the sound in my head, it's messing with my powers. Now, you'll be able to go to St. Gabriel's, just like your brother Paddy. Da smiles, putting his disgusting, orangey-brown, fag-burnt fingers on my shoulder. He means wear Paddy's old uniforms like I've done my whole life. Paddy's old everything, even his bloody trunks. I look at Da and know with absolute certainty that this man is not my father. Just as I know by the smallness of his eyes that this is all his fault because everything bad that has ever happened to our family is because of him. We'll see ourselves out, sir, says Da, holding out his hand, acting like he doesn't want to cause any trouble when that's all he's ever done. You can take Michael home now, help him through the transition, says Mr. Brown. No, I'm sure he'd rather be here playing with his friends, wouldn't you, son, says Da. Friend, duh, one friend. That's how much he knows. And no, actually, I'd like to go home, I say. No problem, says Mr. Brown, looking pale, walking fast out the door. I'll get your school bag, Michael. Silence. And we stir out the window and watch the sun come out from behind a big fuzzy felt cloud. All three of us squint and turn our heads, making sure we don't catch each other's eyes. I start to Mickey, he sighs into the sandpaper shuffle of his hand along his stubble. I've got a big surprise for you. It's coming tonight. I look at the stupid grin on his face. I check my ma and she hasn't a clue. He's a big liar. Ma nods at me and then towards Da, her eyes opening wide. This look means, please, Mickey, play along with your da because you know what will happen to me if you don't. And okay, ma, for you, I know we don't have any money, and I would never scunder you about it. A big surprise, wow, I say, like a kid on the TV, and I look out the window. Then it descends upon me, like the Holy Spirit. It's a dog, Daddy, isn't it? Oh, I'm so happy. It makes up for everything. And ha, I won him. I smile at Ma like I've no idea what I've just done. She said no to your dog since I was five. She's going to break every single bone in my body. But at least then I won't have to go to St. Gabriel's. Thank you. (laughs) We basically had an introduction here into... The Donnelly family, plus uh, we've heard Mickey. He's a very special character. Um, we, we've, I, I think we had all the main characters, like the father, the mother, we Maggie, only the older. There's also an older, uh, the Paddy, the older brother, and there's also an older sister, Mises, who comes in later, and so, sort of she's like a good older sister who does what older sisters do, fills in for her mother. And, um, but altogether, of course, you know, this, the opening scene is a rather sad scene, right? Uh, you know, his greatest wish was to go to this different school, well, to go to America. So it's a sad, sad story. Um, we have this misfit he, who finally wants to go to a school where others are like him. And still, the opening chapter is a chapter where we laugh all the time. So my first question then is, um, what, about, what about, you know, your use of humor? How do you use it? Why do you use it? Is it light relief? Is it a way to... Uh, 
uh, to write about things that otherwise would get too close? Or is it just because you have been a comedy writer and you know how to do it? Because I mean, this is, because this is the thing about the book. I mean, there are so many sad undercurrents and if you, I mean, you could write this very differently, one could write this opening scene very differently. And uh, nevertheless, uh, one laughs, you know, not all the time, but uh, there's always a smile on your face while reading the book. So uh, the humor bit, is it, uh, um, is it, does it come naturally or? What's the function? Well, I suppose I used to write... Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah I used to write comedy, and um, when I first wrote the book, it was really bleak. You know, I really wanted to write a book that was very true to the Northern Irish experience. And um, when I finished, I just didn't think I wanted to put that into the world. You know, I just thought that... I really... I thought about it, and I thought, this is the only book that I write. Is that, is that what I want to say, you know? Um, one of my motivations for writing the book was I remembered as a, as a young uh, boy and living in, you know, abject poverty. And, and, and we would grow up in Ardoin, which was, you know, the biggest slum in Europe at the time. That's what it was, you know, called. And it was, it was appalling, you know, the, the way we lived. And um, uh, on top of that, you had people being shot dead on your front door and the British Army trailing out of your bed in the middle of the night as a child. And you, it, was, it was horrific. You lived in fear every day. And, um, and so when I wrote this book, because I remember when I used to go to libraries and I don't know, Carrie was talking about this, and you know, that, was my, that was my safe space. And it wasn't just because I found books. It was because it kept me off the street and it kept me away from people who wanted to hurt me, uh, kill me, in fact, in, in, in where, where we lived. And it was right on the border of, of a Protestant area, which was, which were, which were the Shankle Butchers were. It was literally on the next street. So the Shankle Butchers were a group of people who um, chopped up Catholics. That's what they were called. They, just, they would come and if you came, if you walked down that street, they knew you were Catholic. So they would pull you in the back, take you to an abandoned place, in, uh, a, a derelict house in their area, and chop you up. I mean, that was our reality. So, you know, it was, um, so libraries became, you know, <laughs> a literal safe space, also being a, a kind of arty farty wee boy as well. I was under a lot of um, a scrutiny from uh, other boys for not being like them. So, you know, um, I think that um, when I was there, I used to look at these books and think, Where's, where am I? Where's this book about, you know, people swearing all the time and who speak like we do in, in our dying about, about children grow up in fear and, and all these things were, were and, and so I think when I thought I would write a novel, I thought, I want, I want to write about that experience. But it was a very, very depressing one, you know. And um, one of the decisions I made was, you know, that, you know, I just didn't want to put that out into the world with, because when I thought about it after I'd finished, I thought, well, I, I'm not like that now. And so if I just left that book, like, you know, the way, the way it actually turned out for me, for example, um, you know, for example, I, I, I would say that this book is about um, uh, this boy takes on the troubles and he takes on the whole uh, community and he takes on the whole idea of it and the lack of love and uh, lack of affection that you're allowed to show as a world. He, he, he challenges all of that and he kind of wins. It's a, it's a compromised win, but he wins. But that certainly wasn't the case for me and most people. I mean, actually, you didn't win. You lost. You lost big and you were incredibly damaged by it. Um, but I decided that if some young boy did pick up this book or, or a young girl or, 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 or a young um, uh, working class person in Belfast, or, you know, that, that, that they would know that I wanted to give them something hopeful. And I think the, the, the comedy um, uh, came into it because also, in, uh, you don't see the mum much there and her sense of humour. Um, which is one of the great pleasures I think I, I had in the book, was, you know, in Belfast's um, humour was a shield mm -hmm. and it was a weapon. And I think when you're powerless, I mean, and we were powerless because, I mean, me, most people are really shocked when they hear this, but when I was born in Northern Ireland, Catholics weren't guaranteed a vote. I mean, just let that sink in for a little second. In the UK, we were not guaranteed a vote. Uh, you know? So we were literally powerless, and then you were kept out of the three main employers. Um, uh, and so, you know, 99% so of the judiciary were 
Protestant, 99% um, of the police force, the three main employers, the, the social services, the, the dockyards, and the, um, uh, <clears throat> you, you were basically, um, they were almost exclusively only employed Protestants. So you couldn't get a job, you couldn't get money, you couldn't feed your family, you couldn't get, you couldn't vote, you couldn't, you couldn't own a property, you couldn't, you had no um, power at all. And so what you do have is your tongue what you have is your mind, and what you can do is you can go, you know, if you can laugh at somebody, particularly those in power, those, you know, you take their power away, you know, you know, and so we became experts at that, you know, just kind of using humor as a way of just taking people down, just cutting them off the knees, you know, and also to shield yourself from what was coming at you. So something come at you, came out, you came back with it. And so I wanted to get that into the book. That's part of Northern Irish. Um, uh, way of way of operating and communicating, and um, and then finally the, th the thing that really the way I looked at it was, you know, I'm going to take people on this really scary, um, dangerous journey with me through this book, and I want them to stay with it. I want them to come. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to build a boat, you know, and the the humour is a boat, mm -hmm. and and I put I put the reader in it. And from that safe place, and um, they they can float along, and they can see the sharks, and they can see the rocks, and they can see there's danger everywhere. But they're they've just got that bit of safety f from those experiences, um, while trying to make it as vivid and real as possible, so that you really felt what this kid was going through. Um, so uh, yeah, that was the sort of final thing that sort of made me think about that. Yeah, the the interesting thing is, of course, they also uh, use the humor not just sort of against their enemy enemies, but they use it among themselves as well, right? I mean, the, the children, they are incredibly mean, mean to each other and the way they, uh, they give each other's nicknames. So there's, there's a boy who's constantly in the book, he's his biggest enemy, and his name is only given as Master Hall, right? Yeah, <laughs> so it's always like Master Hall comes along the street. Oh, there's Master Hall. And uh, then there is, there's Fartin. I mean, like all these yeah. children have... Uh, yeah, I mean, I think anything was anything's a game. You know, you know, you know, they would call you anything, and and um, you know, yeah, you're Mazahor. That could be just your name. Yeah, well, there's Mazahor the there. Like, you get how you used doing? to it after a yeah. while. You think, yeah, that's a yeah. that's a Christian name in Belfast, Mazahor. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, and what I think the thing is is that we have this thing that actually I've never really found to the, deg the same degree any, anywhere else. We, I mean, people say you know, the, um, we call it slagging mm -hmm. in Northern Ireland. Now you have um, when you you know where you 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 make fun of people and um and and people do it all the time in, in other cultures as well but what we do it, it's like when someone walks into the room um your friends you're sitting in front of your friend your friend was saying oh my god you, you know who shot on you today you know and and they and he goes oh shut up what about and it was your ma you know and then they go oh no sure she was running my house last night and it just goes on and you just and you get to the point and the thing is, is you're not allowed to get annoyed if you get annoyed you're lost and so the, so and that is about sort of you know and when the mum in the book, she's, she, the thing she says to him, you know, and he, you know, um, you know, uh, he, he jokes and says, oh, he says, what am I going to do? And he says, you know, put me in a children's home. And she goes, they wouldn't take you, son. You know, they, it's just constantly, you know, uh, you know, all the way through it. She's like that. And really what she's doing is she's kind of doing what, um, she's toughening him up. You know, she sees that he's kind of that little bit weaker and he doesn't play with the boys and he's not getting the same sort of... So she's trying to say, look, I'm t I've got to toughen him up in the streets and every time he tries to get affection from me, she's kind of, she's kind of pushing him off, going, you're going to get killed, kid, you know? You've got to toughen up here. You've got to, you've got to do that. And it's, um, so the humour was also about sort of toughening him up and toughening each other up um, so that you could be... so that you could have these shields and weapons when, um, uh, instead of real ones. You wrote an essay um, about sort of what it means, uh, I'm not sure what the title is, what it means to be Northern Irish today or something like that. And there is a, there's an interesting line in it. It's something about sort of, there must also be sort of uh, an experience the Protestants and the Catholics, at least the working classes, have in common. Because you wrote you know, that at some point, you know, the kids from Belfast would go to the Republic and thought, now that's, you know, finally we're in the land where, you know, where we should belong. And then they realized, hmm, um, actually, the Irish and the Republic are not so keen on us here as well. And, uh, and so, so my question really is, I mean, is there something like a common working class experience between the Catholics or among the Catholics and the Protestants? Because, I mean, the few Protestants that show up in the book, basically they don't really show up uh, other than uh, as intruders, uh, but they also come across as rather working class and with a sharp tongue and with sort of, uh, uh, with a similar background. So I wonder whether this isn't um, 
Well, that this isn't a book, I mean, apart from the fact that it's, of course, written from one perspective, but a book for both sides of the, of the walls, or on yeah. one side of Schenkel Road or Argonne or wherever. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot in there. I mean, I think that, you know, there's a... Northern Ireland is, honestly, I mean, it's this forgotten place, you know. No one gives a shit about Northern Ireland. I mean, no one does. I mean, you know, people in the south of Ireland do not want Northern Ireland. The people, by and large, in England and, and in the rest of the UK do not want Northern Ireland. I mean, you know, Northern Ireland is like this damaged child, okay? And it's hidden away in the attic, you know? And, you know, it, you know it's got this cold, distant father, you know, who just throws money at it to, to ease its guilt. And uh, this kind of guilt-ridden mother who left, um, who left the kid behind in the divorce because of, she wanted a better life. You know, that's, that's, that's the situation in Northern Ireland and neither the, neither the South of Ireland or the people, the, the people in the UK really want to hear it because they don't want to know, you know, the situation and it, it's, it's horrific and it still is horrific, by the way, um, but I won't go into that too much. But, um, but I think that, um, you know, it's definitely what I was trying to posit in that, and, say, and say in this, um, uh, article was, you know, we have more in common, the people more in Ireland, yeah. Protestant Catholic, we have more in common than we do with looking at these parents mm -hmm. who you really don't want to. And at some point in an abusive relationship, you know, and, and you've, you've got to say, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna be part of this anymore, I'm actually gonna grow up now and, uh, and not seek love from people who do not love me. That, and that, that, that's, that's my, what I was saying. And, and also, what I, also the point I was making was, you know, there's an international language of poverty, you know, need. You know, when you can't feed yourself, I mean, there's times in the book where he's putting his dinner back in the, in the, in the pot, you know, so that his mum doesn't worry about that. He's, he goes and gets, job, he gets money from little jobs and puts money in his mum's purse. And, you know, he's, you know, he's, it's, um, it's, you know, abject poverty these people are living in. She's doing two jobs while still in debt to the people who are coming around trying to collect money from her or whatever. And, um, you know, I think that, um, the pe you know, we, poor people, I mean, I, you know, I think I have more in common, or I was saying that more in common um, with people um, who are, are who live across there and, and and who are Protestant in Northern Ireland, and the people that hold the same passport as me down in the south, you know. So I think that uh, it's a very it's a complex business. But what I was trying to say was about in that essay was about moving forward. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you do that? And it was about partly about the anniversary of um, the 1916 and the freedom Irish freedom. And, um, you know, and, and whether to celebrate that. And, and I was sort of saying, well, you know, what I had come to understand from moving home was that, you know, it's sort of time to stop picking up flags and waving them and putting them down. Mm -hmm. You can use your hands for other things. Use your hands to shake other people's hands, you know, use your hands to build things. Use your hands to hold people, you know, you can, have, you can, you can you know, just picking up flags and waving them at this day and age, you know, what does it bring us? What is it doing to us, you know? And now you have Brexit, and now you have all these other things, you know. And it's bananas, you know. The whole concept of it—it's just, you know, when you come from somewhere like Northern Ireland, where people are, you know, have spent decades killing each other just because that other person wants to call the ground under your feet theirs. That's not your. La you're not. You're standing on my ground. I'm British, and so you, that's mine. Don't you dare call it this. And they're saying, no, don't you dare call it that, because we were here first. Well, we were here second, but but we have these people. You know, get on with you know building hospitals and paying your nurses, and you know stop. We have the highest teenage suicide rate in Europe. Stop your stop your children killing each other. You know, stop killing themselves. Stop 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 your children doing that. Never mind on the rest of the nonsense. Put your mind where it's supposed to be. You know, protect your kids. So you know, I can get very passionate about things like that. So don't, don't poke, poke the bird too much. <laughs> yeah, I, I just wanted to bring the conversation out to sort of the brighter spot, but uh, I totally have got the wrong question here because my next question was like uh, um, the last three books, uh, sort of 
books from Irish authors I probably have read, well, maybe not the last three, but three so sort of stuck in my mind, are all about misery childhoods. You know, like, there is, it, it, it's like the mono, like, you know, the Irish monopolizes the misery childhood uh, <laughs> memoir. I mean, Frank McCord and Andreas Asher slums in Limerick in the 30s and 40s. Uh, uh, I uh, read Hugo Hamilton, who grew up in Dublin. He's got it sort of a nationalist father, German mother, very problematic, very difficult childhood. Uh, but then it was a memoir, I mean, and there's, uh, uh, what's his name, uh, P Paddy Doyle, Paddy Clark, ha, ha, ha. I mean, it's always about dysfunctional families. So um, I wonder uh, whether, isn't it, is it sort of, well, the Irish obviously don't have a monopoly on uh, misery. Yes, childhood. we do. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, get, you, oh, get your hands off our misery, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> Got your own stuff. Or is it also a bit the other way around? The Irish sort of misery is something that people sort of, you know, that's, that's, it's a genre we recognize and we can sort of, uh, uh, you know, German publisher buys it immediately because we know that's, that's what we... We because it was really good. <laughs> yeah. It's because another misery... No. Yeah. I, I, I don't really know what to say about that other than, you know, I, you know, I don't... But you haven't been influenced by the genre. This is I haven't, actually. Well, yeah. Look, I think, you know, I mean, I think oh, it's a really complex thing because part of me wants to say, you know, I'm not really interested in the industry. Yeah. I'm not really interested mm -hmm. in what other people have written because I didn't write that book to compare myself or to better or to be enter some sort of competition or, or to join a, a tribe uh, like uh, of, of other writers. I mean, I wrote it to sp give a voice to people who don't have one. Mm. You know, like in this society, you know, I had a big argument with this bunch of writers the other day. It was awful. They all got up and left. It was terrible. But, um, you know, I said to them, you know, like, you know, here we are sitting here and um, in this pub in Belfast and we're talking about, and I said, like, you know, here we are, we, the teenage suicide has written, you know, and um, why, don't, why, don't, why didn't I know that until I arrived? You know, I'm only living over in London. So, you know, who's, who's, if these kids can't express themselves, what's wrong with them to the point that they are gonna kill themselves. Whose job is it to find words mm -hmm. for people who can't find them themselves? The people whose gift it is? Yeah, to, to me it's just the most obvious thing in the world, but to other people they find that really offensive because they're kind of going, well, no, it's, I, I, my job is just to write what I write, and I don't, I don't, that's not my job, I don't have any responsibility. So, and I have that, you know, and I kind of, okay, oh, yeah. Because uh, <laughs> I was going to say to you, and, and there's the answer, well, like, I just do what I want. I, I want to write a book, and if it's the only book I write, that that's the one I want, that's mm -hmm. the story I want to tell. So I don't, I'm not, I'm not entering into any competition or, or joining a tribe. Yeah. But, but, you know, but, but, but at, at the same time, though, I do feel that there is a sort of um, responsibility um, to to um, and particularly because of where I came from and my background and you know being you know not reading many I mean maybe there is lots of misery memoirs and stuff like that but I never I never didn't read any books about working class Belfast and I didn't read one what it was like I mean the first line is you know I was born the day the trouble started I wanted to say you know here's a book that's going to tell you from a child's perspective someone who has known nothing but fear because it's already started by the time he's born. And he, he did, you know, we grew up in fear, terror, every day of your life. I mean, even going to school, you were terrorized on the way up. You know, anything could happen to you, you know. Uh, you, you, and I, I try to get that into the book, you know, and I don't think that is an amendment. I mean, that's not the same as just saying, I'm not trying to compare myself. I hate doing things like that. But what I wanted to say is my book is about Northern Ireland. It's a very specific time in Northern Ireland. And it's about the troubles and it's about fear. It's about growing up. And it's not, a, mem it's not a memoir, right? It's, it's not a, a memoir. It's, it's a novel. It's, I mean, there it is, is a, me a novel. I have to, at some point, somebody has asked a question, so I do it right now. It's always the most embarrassing question. It's literary uh, readings. Uh, so how much of you is in Mickey? Oh, and you know, yeah. Then it's the questions out of the way, you know? I mean, like, <laughs> there has to be, at some point, you know, the autobiographical question. Um, or yeah. is, that, is that the kind of boy you, you wish you had been <laughs> with 10? Because I mean, like, I wish I'd been like, I mean, that kind of self-confidence that this yeah. boy has at 10 in that environment. So yeah. uh, is there? I didn't, have, I didn't have that at all. And, you know, as I said earlier, I think, you know, if in the, in the book, you know, you, know, the you know, Mickey beats the troubles. Yeah. I mean, that's, the, the troubles beat me. You know, absolutely beat me hands down. You know, and I, I think that. Um, but I think that you know, 
what I want, I mean, you know, m the mum in it is a, is a mixture of two people, <laughs> my mum and my aunt. And, um, and so, so I thought that was a really clever way of not making it so autobiographical, you know what I mean? I, I just sort of give it to qualities that they both could argue over, you know, like, I'm not sure that's me, you know, the whole way through, you know. Um, but, um, and um, there's definitely, the relationship with my little sister, definitely, and we're still uber, super close. Tele you know. Telepathic community. Oh, we still, I, yeah, I know. She just said, say hello. Um, <laughs> now, um, uh, so she's, um, she's amazing. I talk to her every day. She's still my best friend um, and things like that. Um, and that was another thing I hadn't um, read a lot about. Uh, read, read, read was, was, was um, in fiction was, you know, brother and sister, you know, uh, that close and things. And I was definitely, you know, um, you know, a, you know, Puffy gay boy in in that line at the time, you know, I you know I was absolutely terrorised, you know, for not being like the other boys and um, being different. But Mickey, what I, I, you know, when I I made fictionalised, I mean, he's no longer anything like me. Mm -hmm. he, there are experiences in there that I. What I wanted to do was make this book. I decided in my head was I wanted to be able to say that everything in that book is true, it's emotionally true, mm -hmm. but it didn't necessarily happen to me. Um, and it didn't necessarily, and things that did happen to me didn't happen to me in that order, or you know they had been 20 years apart or whatever, or I observed as a primary school teacher or, or whatever. So I think that um, it's got definitely the arena is absolutely authentic, you know. And again, as a first-time novelist, you know, um, I wanted to be able to uh, be confident that I was doing a good job and, and knowing that no one could say no, but it wasn't like that in 1930. You know, I really wanted to have that confidence and uh, yeah so the arena is definitely that also I came I came from a theater background so I'd only written dialogue mm -hmm. you know yeah, that's a fantastic until thing about 10 years ago it, or the, or the, and the book is full of fabulous fabulous dialogue and that's why you keep going 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 and you want to hear what they're talking 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 you actually start reading quicker once you know you get into the book because <laughs> there's so much pace in it yes but I think now it's a good point to uh, to have a second Okay. Part in terms of reading, right? I think we want to hear more. We want to hear more from Mickey. Uh, um, this is because um, um, I just have to find it. Um, uh, Juno Dawson asked me to read a new bit, so I spent um, two hours going through it trying to find bits that she wasn't. Or yelling at. I did. I didn't even go to sleep. I, <laughs> I was. Perfectly intending to go for a wee nappy now, and I, instead I was looking through bits. Um, right, so I'm, I don't. So it may be a wee bit patchy because I haven't read them before. Out um, and um, and I've done these big cuts. Okay, so I'll read you um, some of this. <clears throat> right, so I'll read you two two different sections. Okay, so um, do you know what a girl's world is? Girl's world or doll's world? Yes. It, okay, so if you didn't have it in Germany, you, you would have had it, it had to be around the world, because it basically was a, a girl's head, a rubber head, like that. And maybe her shoulders and neck, wasn't it? Shoulders and neck and a rubber head with long blonde hair. And little girls would get her for Christmas and they would brush her hair and put makeup on her. No? You did not, you do, oh, you do, right, okay. So this was, um, this is, this is uh, Mickey, so when I say girl's world now, you know what it was, okay? <clears throat> Because I'm sure, it, I must have written that, because I've written that in pencil, so explain it. So I must come up, I don't remember. So, okay, so, come on, uh, come on, son, I lift. He's got a dog now called Killer, because he thinks it makes, it, it makes him hard to call it Killer. Right, okay. Um, come on, son, um, I lift Killer up and bring him into wee Maggie, uh, me Waggy, wee Maggie's room. I look around for something to play with. On top of the chest of drawers is our... Maggie's girl's world with her long blonde hair like Martine McNulty's hair, who's just as beautiful. I bet you Martine will be a model when she grows up. Round the neck of a girl's world is a long string of pearls. You have to be careful they don't get tangled up. I bought them for my ma and I paid one whole pound. I saved up for ages. I told um, her to leave them to wee Maggie in her will. 
Maggie's asked me a few times when Ma might die. Um, Ma says it won't be long the way you torture me. Uh, oh, out the window I see Breach McAnally. And I tell Killer, she's the oldest of all of us in the street, and she's the biggest, baddest, nastiest, evilest bitch in the whole wide world ever. Her ma is Mrs. McAnally, a big bitch too. The family are like the Olsons from Little House on the Prairie. Do you remember I showed you them on the TV this morning, Killer? Only Mr. Olson, he isn't in the IRA. I hope Killer doesn't get nightmares, but you do have to scare him off, you know. Breege McAnally now walks over to the gable wall and leans against it. The girls stand round waiting for Breege to decide what game they'll play now. There's Martine, coming out her back gate. She's been watching just like me. Are we the same? Or are we meant to be together? I drop Killer onto the bed and put Girls World on the windowsill so I can see Martine behind her in the street. I pull back Girls World's yellow hair and kiss her on the mouth while looking at Martine behind it. I try it the way they kiss on the TV and my dick throbs. Killer, don't be telling anybody I did that right, I say. And I trust him. I turn him, I turn him on his back now and, he's, and I blow on his belly like I used to do when I gave belly farts to wee Maggie. I've got a really funny idea. I take the pearls and I put them round Killer's neck. What else? I open the wardrobe and see our measles first Holy Communion dress. <gasps> White and lacy. Like a wedding dress? We're keeping it for our Maggie's turn. One day I put it on we Maggie and we set our vows to the TV screen to be together forever. <laughs> we may actually be husband and wife. I'm not 100% sure it was legal in the eyes of God. I've not been ordained, but, and of course there's also the brother and sister thing, I don't know. I scrunch up the dress um, uh, to the neck and like Ma does when she's putting our jumpers on and I wiggle it over Killer's head. When Ma would do that for me, when I was wee, I'd feel like I was never gonna get out of the darkness. I feel like I was being strangled and suffocated at the, t at the same time. I'd scream and Ma would slap the legs of me for being dramatic. I've, I was always going to be an actor. Killer looks at Gag. It's so funny. He's like the chimps in that TV bag, uh, t sorry, that tea bag advert, all when they're all dressed as people. And I lay his head on the pillow. Go to sleep now, my child. God is waiting for you on the other side, I say. Like I'm a priest and he's dying. <laughs> Maybe he's like a dying bride in a black and white movie set sometime in the American Civil War. Um, every time he lifts his head, I push it back down till he lies there and I watch him. He looks at me from the corner of his eye with his mouth open and his tongue out. God, his breath smells like dirty trunks. There's boys' noise outside. I juke out and there's, a ga there's gangs coming out of Havana Way entry. They walk over to the gable. Came, kids come running out of their houses like some whistle was blown that all children can hear except me. Everyone from the street together, boys and girls. Brill! I can join, because it's everybody there. I bomb down the stairs, but slow walk outside and sit on Macarlane's garden wall. I watch the waste ground jammed with kids. In a wee while, I'll just start playing without them even noticing. We're playing skips first, says the big bitch, Breach. Skips, decky. The head of the boys' gang looks disgusted. We'll be back then, he walks away, and the boys follow him. I really should go off at the boys, but I'm actually brilliant at skips. And I want to show Martine how brilliant I am, and Maggie will be so proud of me. This is the most excited I've actually been in my entire life. <laughs> Martine will think I'm the best boy because I'm not like the others, and, and, and her and me like the same things. 
Oh shit, there's our Paddy back, walking across the street looking at me. It's your turn, Mickey, says wee Maggie, and the rope goes. And I have to go, because it's my turn. One, two, three, they count me in. I don't go. So they stop the rope. What's wrong with you, Breege, says, and she's really pissed off. Paddy looks over. Breege sees him. She looks at me and smiles. She knows. Start the rope, she says. One, two, three, and a hundred girls join her all shouting. One, two, three, for me to go in, and I jump in. I have to. I skip like I've never skipped before, shitely. I see Martine's face. She's destroyed. She's so disappointed in me. Probably been waiting all this time just to see me skip. I get put out because, you know, like it looks like I'm crap because this whole game is for girls and our potty can see. Take an end of the rope, Breach orders, and I don't. I said, take an end, and she walks towards me. No, I say, and everybody stares at me like I just stabbed the Pope. <laughs> Mickey, come you in here right now. My ma's voice fills the street. She sees I've heard and goes back into the house. I have to go, I say, because everybody knows that you have to when your ma calls you, so they can't say anything to me. So I grab wee Maggie and I pull her with me. I want to play, she whines. Shut up you, I say, and I pull her over into the house. Our Paddy stops me before I go in and grabs me. Stop playing with the wee girls for fuck's sake. You're too old for that now. The boys are all laughing at you. Jesus, they're going to murder you in St. Gabriel's. And stop friggin' crying like a wee girl, he says, letting me go. I'm not crying, you big pig, I say. Why do you sound like a girl anyway? What the fuck is wrong with you? Are you gay? Our potty's really turned evil. I walk in my head down till I get inside and I turn back and go, you were crying too when the soldiers beat the shit out of you and I tell you what, I wish they'd hit you harder. And I run top speed and ha, I won him. He's going to kill me when he gets me, but... Ma's in the living room. Stay away from that breach, Mac and Alley. Do you hear me, says Ma? Yes, Mummy, says me, in my good boy voice, because I'm a good boy who does what he's told. Now, follow me up the stairs, she says. At the top of the stairs, I can't breathe and my whole head throbs. From the open door, you can see Killer asleep in bed wearing pearls and Mesa's holy communion dress. <laughs> How did, says Ma, I don't know, Mummy, I swear to God. <laughs> Mickey Donnelly, tell me the truth and shame the devil. You know fine rightly, Killer couldn't have done that himself. I send you to the priest, says she. I don't know, mummy, I swear to almighty God. I can't, I can tell she's not going to hit me, though. Let's leave him here, mummy, for a gag. They'll all die when they see him. She's not buying it. We'll say you sent him to bed for being cheeky, and or say he made his holy communion today, you know. You're away in the head, son, she says. You know you can't keep carrying on like this, don't you? I don't know what she's talking about because I've never put killer in a wedding dress before. <laughs> yes, mummy, I say. Uh, get him out of that bed and out of that dress and you may pray to God there's not a mark on it or you'll be covered in marks. Ma does a big long sigh. Come here, come here. Come and sit down first. I need you to be a big boy now, Mickey. What's wrong? says Ma. Nothing. I smile and bounce my bum up and down on the bed, like, you know. What did our Paddy say to you downstairs? Nothing, Ma, I say. Tell me right now, wee boy, or I'll get him to tell me, says Ma. No, Mummy, please don't. I'm so scundered. Mickey. My throat makes this sort of strange noise, and I turn away and peck killer. Mummy, do you know how, um... My voice is not like, um, do you know how I don't sound like the other boys? Ma stops breathing and I pet killer, but gently, gently, gently. 
That's cause you speak nice, son. Her voice getting closer. I know, but you know how I don't put mummy? I don't sound like the other boys. And I rub Killer's wee ear in the special place I know he loves. You speak much better than Nemans, and sure, what are you worried about? Any day now you'll wake up and you'll sound like a big man. Well, I mummy, I look at her. Something's happening in my brain. Of course, she elbows me in the ribs. It's all about growing up and boys' stuff and stuff. And your voice breaks and all, and your, da- your dad will tell you all about it. Mummy, sometimes the boys make fun of me. Who makes fun of you? My ma says, going red, and oh no, the Hulk is coming. <laughs> Was our Paddy? It's okay, mummy, I say, scared. And Ma reverses the Hulk process somehow. She must have caught it just before it took over. I'll go round and bust their faces for them. Ma bounces up like a boxer and like the Carly Lion from The Wizard of Oz. And I laugh and I jump up beside her because I haven't seen her done, do anything like this in years. Put them up, put them up, I say, like the best cowardly lion. And Ma laughs, my Ma laughed. I bet you they can't do that with their voices, son. Eh? And she's right. I was the best in my class, and I grab around her waist, and I put my face in her tummy like I did when I was wee, and she lets me stay there for a good five seconds before she pushes me off by the shoulders. But gentle. Mickey, did Mike Paddy say anything to you about what he's up to? Says she. No, Mummy, sure our Paddy doesn't tell me anything. He hates my guts. <laughs> Ma whacks me across the head. Ow, your brother does not hate you. Don't be going around saying things like that. Paddy loves you. He's just got hormones, she says. <laughs> Brain damage, you mean, I say. <laughs> Ma swings for me. Stop that, you. Josie, are you ready? It's Aunt Kathleen shouting from downstairs. Ma gets up and goes down, and I follow her. Oh, do you have a girlfriend yet, Maggie? Or Mickey says, Aunt Kathleen all smiles. No, I laugh. I take a double redner and I rub my hands between my thighs. I love her asking though and I jump beside me Maggie on the sofa and hold her hand. Oh, Mickey's, our Mickey's not like that, says Ma, annoyed at Aunt Kathleen. He's a good boy, aren't you, son? Yes, mummy, I say. She won't tell her what I did with Keller up, up the stairs because you don't tell people things from outside the house. Oh, he loves his mummy, says Aunt Kathleen, beaming at me. Um, get that do- friggin' dog in the yard, wee boy, do you hear me? Ma whispers and stands back up. I swing my legs out back and forward and bang them onto the bottom of the tea like I used to when I was really wee. Wee Maggie joins in and we laugh and Ma shakes her head and says, What am I going to do with you, Mickey Donnelly? Put me in a children's home, mummy. She says, they wouldn't take you, son, says she. And I laugh and look at wee Maggie and me and her, we go away with the fairies. And I hear Ma leave and I'm a big boy now and I can mind Maggie on the, in the house by myself. And I'm going to be, get my big boy's voice and everything. And oh my God, I try to shove my fist into my mouth and out again. I can mind you. We can be together forever and on our own. I grab her by her hands and pull her up and jump in a circle, but her jumps are a bit heavy. She just keeps looking out the window as if she wants to play with the girls. Come on, I shout in a pogo like a punk rocker. And she laughs and she does it too. And I've got a brilliant idea, says me. Shall we get married again? I do, says Maggie. I do. I do quick till we get Killer out, out of the wedding dress, unless you want him to be a bridesmaid. <laughs> Thank you. Well, it's um, easy to imagine that uh, someone like Mickey doesn't really fit in to, to his neighborhood. Uh, you mentioned in a conversation um, um, beforehand uh, a word like something like toxic masculinity, uh, sort of, you know, that's something that you experienced as a boy in Belfast. Um, toxic masculinity, what elements you think is a part of that, or what, you know, is there a specific Belfast version of it? I mean, like, we all sort of know what traditional masculinity probably is, but... I think it was kind of... Oh, I, sorry, thank you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think, absolutely, I mean, it, it, and, and in working class areas, I think that can be 
heightened, but also, you know, you, we were in an environment, um, you know, where uh, it was a br brutal and brutalizing, you know, and um, so you have um, that reflected in children's behavior, but children are mean anyway, you know, um, but the boy, there was definitely a very um, toxic um, uh, masculinity in this um, idea. The, I think the other problem that was there that, was, that made it really heightened was that you're under a microscope. You know, you're in a big city, but there was a wall at the top of my street that, I, that you couldn't mm -hmm. get through. There was a wall at the bottom of my street that you couldn't get through. There was, at the, at the, at the right, there was a hill and at the top of there led to a Protestant area. And then at the back, there was, the, you could go through our down at the top, and then there was the Shankill Road. So basically, we were surrounded by Protestants. And if we crossed into those areas, you, you, you know, they would kill you. That's a simple, it's just a fact. It's not a, you know, the, and, and vice versa, you know. Um, but so you, so you basically played within a street or two streets for the majority of your life, you know, and within an environment like that, you know, <clears throat> you're under scrutiny constantly. Mm -hmm. There was also, um, you know, uh, an incident center in every Catholic area where you reported on your neighbors because we didn't respect the police and the, quite often the police didn't come through into the areas, into Catholic areas without a, uh, um, uh, the army. And so you had the armed army, uh, British army patrolling. You had the only armed police in the UK. Um, then you had armed paramilitaries. You know, people got shot outside your back door, got their knees blown off by your own people, by their own neighbors, you know. And you, you know, so there were lists of you know, st stages of, of your punishment. The first punishment was a community beating. And that's when your own community would take hurling sticks, which are like a, it's a game, it's like hockey, hockey sticks, or, um, and they would beat you with these. And that was your first warning. And then after that, um, you know, uh, there was a different stage and then the final would be, well, the second one would be your knees would be blown off, uh, shot off, you know, say, shut, shut, shut your kneecaps off. And then the final would be you, you were banned from the area and if you were seen there, that you knew you were dead. So, the, so, so all of that was going on. So everything, so everybody was watching everyone and, um, and uh, uh, in, in, in the shops, as, as, as in the book there, in the shops, there was all, you know, loose talk costs lives and all these posters with people, you know, with eyes looking in, you know, don't say a word and everyone's listening. You don't know who's, you know, uh, uh, who's, who's, who's a British um, um, a spy or who's, who's, who's um, grassing to the, um, the, the Protestant paramilitaries. And of course, all of the, all of the, a lot of those paranoias turned out to be true, you know, and, and also, you know, things with the collusion between Protestant paramilitaries and the British government, all that stuff's come, you know, that they all said was nonsense. It's all now being proved to be, of course, true. It's, it's quite shocking. Mm. But on an environment like that, you know, everyone's watching this. So if you were different in any way, mm. I mean, you were just uh, terrorized, you know. Um, um, it's like that thing of just the weak, the weak one in the pack, you know. Um, and, and everyone played along. I mean, like, it's not just the men among the, themselves, but it's also the women who sort of exactly had the same ideas of, you know, what proper gender roles they should fulfill or not should not fulfill, right? I mean, like, and the children, I, I find that so strong that they know exactly at the age of eight, you know, what's proper boy's behavior, what's proper girl's behavior. Yeah, definitely. And he's, and there's things that you go, I think he's in the first chapter, he says, you know, oh, you know, she, she you know, measles, boys, boys don't clean. You know, and then I think he says, but you know, but I do because I think it's not fair. Mm -hmm. You know, because but children also have the sense of fairness. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a really big thing for them. You know, inequality, and you know, but that's not fair. He got two peas, and I've got one pea, or you know, that kind of really silly. Down to that. They're really, uh, but um, I think that one of the things that came up for me actually, I was listening to a lot um, uh, in the previous talks, was you know, um, how str I, mean, I grew up with really strong women. I mean, you know, I had five sisters, you know, and they would beat that crap out of anybody, man or woman. I mean, if they needed to, you know, to, you know, to, to, to protect the, themselves or our family or, 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 or whatever. So, you know, and I don't mean just strength in that sense. You know, my, my mom, you know, held two jobs and brought up seven kids more or less by herself, you know. And, um, you know, I'm, to, you know, these women, women, I, I, you know, loved women. I worshipped women growing up, and I just saw, you know, so many fine examples of, um, you know, uh, examples of how to be mm -hmm. from women much more than I did from my male counterparts. And um, I mean, there's a, there's a thread in the book. You know, Mickey's father, for example, is, you know, he's abusive. He's physically abusive. He's um, an alcoholic. He steals their money. You know, in the first chapter. Mm -hmm. His problems with money is why he's not going to 
grammar school, you know, that, and, and there's a whole big theme. Of, I mean, a working class kid getting to grammar school back then was just, it was, you know, an incredible thing. And that opportunity is taken away by his father. And I think that um, what I wanted to say in the book about that with his father, it's so easy to see him as this two dimensional character, but actually there's a scene where the two of them go mm. out for a walk and, and of course he lets him down again because that's all he can do. Mm. But when he, when he sits down beside him, he says, you know, you know, you get out of here, son, you know, get out and get as far away as you can because that's, you know, that's what I wanted and I didn't. And, li and look at me, you know, and, and I think there's, a, there's, a, there's an inference in the book that if Mickey doesn't get out, that's exactly what he's going to turn out to be as well. You know, and I think the whole thing about, you know, addiction and drinking and a lot of it was about alcoholism and, you know, and uh, um, uh, uh, from men and uh, who spent most of their times in, in um, working men's clubs and stuff like that, drinking, you know, and um, was that, you know, my idea around that and alcohol and, and drug abuse is that, you know, that, um, you know, people become addicts and people drink like that and, and to that extent, you know, basically to try and help them forget the person they were supposed to be. You know, and, they didn't and, get yeah. it. They didn't get to be that person. And they can't live with, a, with that knowledge. And so they need to drug themselves every day to forget, you know. Right. And then to that stage and, and to that environment comes a boy whose three favorite films seem to be The Wizard of Oz, Sound of Music, and Grease. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's... Uh, Normally, you know, if you would say that, you know, in a sort of urban gay environment, would say, oh, hello, you're a friend of Dorothy's. So he was literally a friend of Dorothy's without knowing. I mean, all the others call him gay or fruity or, or whatever, and he didn't really have a clue. He just thought, you know, he had special sensibilities. Yeah, well, that's it, because uh, they say to him about the Wizard of Oz, don't they? And he says, he says and, and, he, and the, the voice says, that's your favorite film? Oh, my God, that's like a girl's film. And he goes, oh, what does he know? Because I saw a documentary about how brilliant that film was and how everybody thinks it's amazing. <laughs> and so you just don't know because you're stupid. You know, so he just has this kind of superiority about everything. Yeah. Like, what do you know? What do you know what you don't no, know? No, I think he, he's, he's sort of a camp character without knowing it. I mean, like, I, I actually looked up Susan Sontag again on camp. The essence of camp is its love of the unnatural, of artifice and exaggeration. And he loves nothing more than that. My question really is, um, how do you develop such a camp taste, or such a taste in the first place, in such an environment. I mean, like, there, it was not full of role models, as you mm. just described it. It's not mm. like, you know, that Oscar Wilde went down the street, up and down. It's sort of... Uh, well, I, yeah, I mean, I, 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 do you know what? I don't know. Yes, it's... I would say that, number one, you know, like, you know, Mickey's modeling himself on his mother. In a sense, you know, mm -hmm. and I don't think he, but he's, he also is playful. And so the, I don't think that he's necessarily, he's becoming camp by playing mm -hmm. with all of those roles. And he's, he's playing, and, and he becomes, he conflates that whole idea of, you know, his, his burgeoning kind of understanding of sexuality and gender with, with, with acting. And actually, I <laughs> believe gender is an act. You know, we, we are taught to act a certain way and we gradually learn the way we're supposed to sit, you know, or the way we're supposed to talk, the, you know, what register we talk in, you know, how, how demonstrative we are with our hands or, you know, how, you know, what things we watch. I mean, it becomes like a role. We play these roles, you know, and I wanted to sort of hint at that, that he's learning and he, he gets, the, 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 he goes to the priest and the priest says, you know, you're, you're definitely a bit of an actor, you know, here's a book on acting and he, so he sees that, uh, Montgomery Clift was a uh, bisexual and um, you know he he sort of likes this guy's hairy legs but he also likes the girl and he's and he sort of thinks you know at one point when all the kids are teasing you and they were going oh you're gay and he says no no I know what I am I know what I am and you think yeah he's gonna say it you know he's gonna say it and he, and, and um, he goes I am an actor <laughs> you know but he's really, really kind of what he's kind of says I'm a bisexual but he doesn't even know what that he just thinks because I like boys and girls you know, and it's just, the thing is that we are not comfortable not, we, we are uncomfortable not knowing what he is. Mm. It's other, it, he never, it never comes out in the book and says that he's gay. But what it is, is he's, that we He's way not, too small for that, really. Well, yeah. I mean, well, Ten year old. Some, some, yeah. some people know, but he, it's everybody else that goes, he's gay, he's gay, oh, he's gay, he's gay. Look at the way he talks, look at the way he walks, look at the way he likes does. And so everybody's, everybody's boxing him all the time. 
And he's just like, what evs? I know more than all of you put together. I'm the smartest guy in town, you know? And he's just got that complete sort of, I don't know, like some sort of buffer around him, you know? And it comes from, I mean, it's not that he doesn't get affected by what's going on, but he's just got this resilience. And, um, and I think that is um, something that I, I guess when I looked back and thought, what do I want to give to humanity? If this book is a if this book is the only book I write, you know, what is, what is this gift, what do I want to say to the world um, if it's the only thing I ever get to say? And it's, you know, fuck them. <laughs> fuck them all. No, I'm, you know, just fucking fuck them all, you know. Just be whoever you want to be and let them call you what they want to call you and just let it bounce off you. And then if we kid does pick this book up and yes, there are things in it they probably should be, you know, that, that they go, you know, yeah, yeah, he's got the right attitude, you know. Um, yeah. Just, yeah. I can be whoever I want, you know. Yeah, well, it's like the big Northern Irish handbook on, you know, how to, how to be a resilient boy. Resilience is probably exactly the right word. Maybe one last question before, before I open it to, to everyone here. It's the role of, um, I mean, to, uh, to a certain degree, you alluded to that already, sort of uh, American pop culture. I mean, like we said already, you know, like The Wizard of Oz, and there's always the American dream, and, you know, I dream, and the escape dream is the American dream, and somehow... Uh, Isn't it somewhat ironic that sort of the most liberating thing or the most sort of wonderful things you can think about are sort of products of commercial American culture? I mean, to a certain degree, that's probably the true, true for all of us, because, I mean, we're all colonized by, uh, by the American culture industry. But uh, nevertheless, you want, one would want sort of something more, I don't know, sophisticated. But no, it's the sound of music that makes you resilient. Isn't that, isn't that ironic? Yeah, well, I mean, I think the whole American culture thing, I think it was, you know, it very was of, of, of the time, yeah. you know, and I think that um, it's yeah. not just about, it wasn't about, it wasn't about them being American. It was about them being wealthy. Mm -hmm. It was about them having houses, you know, where people had their own bedrooms. I never had one bedroom. I mean, I, I shared a bed with four people up until I was about, I don't know, 12 or something, you know, um, you know, well, that's a lie, actually. That's a complete lie. Hold on, let me wind that way in there. Hold on. Mm -hmm. Not until I was 12. Mm. That would be disgusting. Um, but anyway, when I was a young boy, and we, you know, we, we, I certainly shared a room, you know, um, with, with, with three, a bedroom with three people, and, and originally, um, you know, a, a big bed was loads of us shared. Um, but, um, you know, I, I think that it was just about luxury. It was about getting out of there. And I, you know, I'd never, I never saw a posh person mm. in my whole life, except on the television. I never saw, never, was never in a house. That, that looked nice. I was barely ever out of Ardoin, you know, where I lived, because we were walled in, and you know, so there was no, uh, you know, I didn't know. Uh, that was your. That was a. It was also. It was about wealth. Mm. It's about sort of you know um, being other than this life, a life where you could get into a car and drive to a desert, or you know, go, go out and and and, and, and lap, land of opportunity and freedom and all of those myths that you buy, you know, that he was buying into, you know, and also the acting, all the movies, you know, they were all, and my, my mommy, like, it was so funny, I mean, you know, with books in the house and things like that, my mom, they were close to devil worship, you know, to my mommy, you know, um, and, um, and so I had to read, it was another reason why I read in the library mostly, and also, you know, funny about films and all the stuff, you know, but, you know, um, it, 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 she couldn't stand that really posh British accent. Because I think it just really, you know, really reminded her of her class, it reminded her of lots of things. And she, so she wouldn't really like watching British films, but American films were, were fine, you know. So I think there was a lot of reasons for me why I really did associate that and thought I could write about that. And it's, of course, it's buying into the old Irish myth of looking across to Ireland, uh, from Ireland to America as well, you know. The funny thing, of course, is that this uh, really Mickey, uh, in the book, for the first time, he has an outing that he actually comes out of this restricted space and sees the sea. I mean, like, it's so amazing. You live in Belfast and yet never seen not even the outskirts of Belfast. And he was on this hill and finally he sees the sea. And it was like, wow, you live in the middle of this and you didn't even have a clue that this is there. Well, that the, first, the first time he had left those two streets yeah. in his life, you know, so he, he was literally going, oh my God, you know, this is, this is incredible. And also what he saw was because Belfast is surrounded with mountains. So even when he tried to imagine or visualize getting out, he just saw himself... You know, when when you walked up the hill nearby, you know, you just saw this, um, you know, grey, black and white slum, um, you know, surrounded by these walls and then behind it, surrounded by mountains. So it's like you couldn't even get out, 
even if you want, even you got out of Belfast. So when he saw that visual image of of of, of a sea that, that led out somewhere that wasn't here, he thought, you know, I will get away. From, you know, I'm gonna get. Even I gotta get a boat. You know, I'll get out of here. You know. There are lots of other things we could talk about. We haven't really talked about the literary production. How we, how do you act? You know, how do you perform as a writer? We've seen how you perform as a reader, but how do you write? Lots of other things. But maybe there are questions from you. It's difficult to see you, but uh, oh, there is a first sign on the back in the back row, and there I see a second uh, sign there also in the back row. Let's start with the yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, thanks very much. I inhaled this book when I read it, and I would recommend it to everybody. It's what fantastic. Did it smell like? Sorry? What did it smell like? <laughs> <laughs> I ate it. <laughs> um, it touched me on a lot of levels. My dad was in the British Army, um, and we're the same generation. He thankfully never got sent to Northern Ireland because he joined an Irish regiment. Um, but I do remember him checking his car for IRA bombs in the morning before he went to work, so this resonates. And uh, my question is, there's a very, very frightening, really frightening scene when Mickey's in, um, um, in the garage. Mm. Um, and, and I started thinking about these people from this generation, and so you're an artist, you're a writer, you can express this in that way, but there's so many damaged, traumatized people, and you know, what do they do with this? With this you know, they've lived through this, what, you know, how do they cope with that in, 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 mm. in later life even? But they don't. I mean, this is this is the shocking thing. This is the thing, and I I will try and curtail myself here. But, um, <clears throat> you know, there are parts of Belfast, areas of Belfast, like say, you know, nine, ten thousand people, where fifty percent of um, the adults my age are on sickness benefits, like permanently. Um, um, the the medication is given out for stomach conditions. You know, uh, insomnia. You know, every single one of my family have insomnia. All of us have stomach issues, um, and that's basically because there was helicopters at night, there was people banging your door at night, there was guns going off at night, there was, you know, you were, and you lived in fear all day with your stomach in knots, so by the time you tried to go to sleep, your stomach was still in knots. Your stomach spent so many years in knots that it's now a mess, you know, that's a reality. And, you know, I told you about this conversation I was having with these, um, um, these writers, and I, you know, I said to them, you know, they were going, oh, the troubles, and you know, it's all over. And I said, well, why do you think these kids were killing themselves? You, th you think it's, a, you think it's a coincidence? You, th you think it's got, <laughs> it's a coincidence that we have the highest teenage suicide rate, even though these kids have never seen the troubles. But you don't, you don't think it's connected? Of course, it's connected. You know, they're taking on their parents. You know. It's, it's their parents are my age who were born and lived through that for decades, and they, what their troubles, are being passed on. They may not be getting shot in the street, or, although that happened twice in the month that I moved back. By the way, so this is other thing. That's another thing I'm not going to get into. But um, uh, you know that um, these they're passing it on, and it's still there. And um, it's, it's, if you think about it too much, it's, it would blow your mind. Um, mm. Well, well done for writing it. I think it's a really fantastic book. And everybody should I like buy you. it. I don't know how many com <laughs> copies you have down there, but... I think you and I are going to be besties. Yeah. I think. <laughs> well, I'm coming to your workshop tomorrow, no! so... <laughs> Can you come sit beside me, please? <laughs> I think you're going to be my favourite people. I'm a good girl. I, 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 know, I know. I knew that already. There was another question next to you. Yeah. And I also wanted to say thank you for the fantastic reading. That was so much fun. And um, I really liked what you, uh, what you said uh, really specifically about Northern Irish humor before. And um, also, you said everything in that book is true, even if it didn't happen to me or anyone I knew. And it reminded me, strangely, of Hunter S. Thompson uh, talking about gonzo journalism and how he really didn't make anything up, but he could get a truth he could get at the truth through fiction. It, it, was, it was a truer truth somehow. And um, I wonder if you could comment a little bit more generally, especially in the context of, of today, about how humor might actually help us to get more at the truth, and fiction might help us to get more at the truth, whether or not you agree with that or, or just comment on it in general. Um, I, don't, I don't know. Um, I think I talked about it earlier on about you know my thoughts on that, and I think that's about the extent of my thoughts. And that you know that humor you know can be used as a weapon, and it can bring it can give you power, and it can take power away from people. You know, and when you you know, um, uh, I do think also just to, just the point before I think that you know I'm an I'm an emotional writer. You know, 
you know, and so um, I like to, to tackle, you know, human relationships and feelings. And, um, and I think that um, people can get really turned off by that, you know, um, either because you go really dark and it's just constant sort of uh, litany of misery, um, you know, or because they just think emotional writing is of a lesser quality. They also think that humor is of a lesser quality, you know, that if you're funny, oh, but he's just funny. Oh, that's just a fun, that's a funny book. Like it suddenly drops three or four places in the literary world or in people's estimation because it's just funny. Yet um, it's one of the hardest things I think to do is to be successfully funny, I think, and consistently funny, but it is not very well respected. Um, and I think that um, the other thing, the emotional writing, I think um, for me, you know, the, the humor um, is the spoonful of sugar to let the medicine go down. You know, there's a wee Mary Poppins thing for you there. Like, mm -hmm. did you see what I did? <laughs> anyway, um, so, you know, there's, there's, it, you know it, it, it allows the a reader to not think, oh, God, this is just so emotional, or, you know, so, you know, that, that I'm sort of cutting myself down in a way. A bit like sort of being self deprecating or something, you know, is that it just allows people to sort of, um, you know, take your kind of flights of fancy and your, your grand emotional issues. And certainly for me, I think writing about love, you know, and um, is, is, is a challenging thing. And I think it's also slightly, I think it's kind of, um, um, okay, so there's a complex ending that's kind of happy, but it's a very complex uh, happiness. And I think that that is much more um, revolutionary or whatever, the, 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 you know, to, to, to try and be happy, to try and bring some sort of happiness, happy conclusion, or to make people feel good, um, you, know, uh, it's, you know, in this world, you know, to, to try and bring hope. You know, and um, you know, and when I was writing one of the last edit I did for the book, that you know, that when I was trying to transform it from this really, really pessimistic work, was that um, I put in the header and footer of each page, where is the love? So every time I started a new page, it was the first thing on my mind, and every time I finished a page, I went back and I read it. Because even if something, someone did something really disgusting and horrible in it, it had to be because of love. You know, the love of their country that made them do something, you know, love of alcohol or whatever. <laughs> but whatever it was, that it was always based on love. And so I think there's a, there's a, uh, a tone in the book mm -hmm. that even though it goes, gets funny or it gets very dark, there's, a, there's an overall feeling of love I think, or something like that, you know? And I think that whatever, I know a lot of writers don't have an intention setting out in their writing, and I absolutely do. I think I have an intention. I want to do, I want to say this, I want to do this, I want to uh, encapsulate this. And then um, I believe that it's in your writing. If it's not in the actual world, it's words, it's underneath them somehow, or it's in the music or the rhythm, or in that little magic thing that writing is, you know, and it's, it's, it comes, you are the magician, you know, and you're gonna put these words in this order and people are gonna say it like that and then the magic will happen and you'll conjure up these people and these places and these smells and, you know, and I think that underneath all of that, you, you give someone a feeling and I think that can be a very powerful um, tool for a writer, I think. Do you have one more, one or two more questions? Okay. Where was it? Over here. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've got so many questions to ask you, but I'll just ask one. Um, I'm very interested in how you. Um, because I know you're very precise with your comedy, like you were saying, that the comedy isn't just for effect, it's actually integral in how you weave the story. But what, what I'm interested in is um, with your story of, it, it's a story that people neglect, that the, the poverty, the, the war that was happening in, in Northern Ireland, how do you find that we relate, because we, we can talk about Syria, for example, but your story is neglected, but it's not only did it happen, it is still happening as you suggested. 
And I, and I wonder how, you know, I know you're doing it through writing this book, but how do we draw attention to some of the things that you're talking about? And I say that to say, because you said it a few times, um, if this is the last book I write. So it's almost like this, this was a privilege for you to write. I don't know if, I, if, if my question makes sense. Yeah, and, and it's a privilege to write this tragedy. It's almost a tragedy, but you're trying to put love into and draw attention to a part of the world that needs that love. How do, how do we, not just as the reader, but how do we acknowledge what is going on in Northern Ireland? Oh God in heaven! But I, I, I mean, sorry, it's quite, quite sorry. A no, no, no! Don't apologize. I mean, it's just, I mean, it's a wonderful thing to think about, and and I, you know, would need to think about it, you know, and I could, I, I don't like saying things I, you know, uh, that I haven't thought through. But I, I think, you know, for me, you know, when I wrote the book, you know, <clears throat> I thought, um, everybody told me that, that no one would publish this book, you know. That nobody's interested in Northern Ireland. No one wants to hear about Northern Ireland. No one's interested, um, and especially if you write it in dialect and you're challenging it. And um, and it was a bit of a struggle initially to get it published, and um, and I had to make some compromises. And it's, it's not just raw, and that's it's raw. There's bits where you know ten year olds are glue sniffing and fingering each other in a factory. You know, I mean, it, that's not going to go on Radio Four. You know, it's not going to happen, you know, there, I wanted to keep that rawness, I wanted to keep that that's the authentic way that we were brought up and, and uh, um, you know, and a, and a lot of still working class experience and the kind of, um, you know, uh, that honesty and that br brutal honesty that we have. And I think that um, I definitely thought that the way to make this book um, travel outside of Northern Ireland was one, to make it really, really specific and honest and raw, because I think that the more specific something is the more universal it is the more absolutely specific you get it because the thread taking it from that to all humanity you know is is right there it's clear for people to see and the, you know and what i wanted to do was write a book about love you know and about um uh that experience and <clears throat> i don't know maybe you know i think if i'm saying anything it's about on um love and understanding and I think that for a lot of uh, um, the book it's about we're here you know maybe if you just see me first if we just start with that I'll take that don't need you to come in and change my life or anything you know but do you just know that I'm here can you just see that these people are here do you need do you even know this I mean I'm I talk to very smart people, um, you know, Jonathan Coe, you know, um, writes sort of political satires and, you know, very, very successful, multi-award winning author. And he read it and he was like, I had no idea. And he switched on. You know, that kind of thing is like, did you even know? Did you even know that that was what we were going through? So just, just, just being heard sometimes is enough, you know, I think. Um, but the rest of that stuff will have to be in the pub, I think, Nick, if that's all right. Yeah. I think these were fabulous last words. No, last words for this conversation, I mean. And, uh, and I think the... <laughs> and I think the question, uh, where's the love on this page, will sort of stay with me from now on, not as a writer, but sometimes basically as a reader as well, and you might learn all that in the workshop tomorrow. Anyway, thank you so much. Uh, I'm not sure that you needed a moderator, but hey, a big hand for... for <laughs>